in the 40, those who could afford it. Now, as we all know, Mr. Nelson Mandela became a lawyer by profession. Robert Zabuke became a professor in linguistics, meaning a professor in oh. different African languages. Uh -huh. He also lectured at the uh -huh. University of Witwatersrand run those years. Now, I did a tour a few days ago, and in the bus were three white African gentlemen, and they told me that Robert Zabuke lectured to them already those years. Now, those years already, he persuaded them to join his party. Mm -hmm. Now, his strong point was, this man, he was a very persuasive person. He could persuade people very easily to follow him. Very persuasive person. He was a very intellectual person also. Now, in 1958, Robert Zabuke and Mr. Nelson Mandela and Walter Sassoulo, they also started the ANC Youth League. But in the same time, Robert Zabuke and a few followers, they broke away from the ANC. Because why? They did not agree with the ANC ideology, so they broke away from the ANC. And then in 1959, they started a political party called the PAC, the Pan-Africanist Congress. Robert Zabuki became the first president to the party those years. Mm -hmm. But now the government that was in control in South Africa was called the National Party. Now the National Party came into existence in 1948, and when they came into power, they implemented many bad laws upon the black people of this country. But now the worst law that was implemented upon the black people was called the pass law. Now the pass law stipulated that each black person from the age of 16 years old, male and females, had to carry a booklet. Now the females had to carry this booklet about their chest in the beginning. The males had to keep it in their pocket. Now this booklet became a black person's whole life after that. It became their whole existence. They couldn't do anything or go anywhere without this booklet. If they were found without this book by the police or by the army, they will go to jail for six months without a trial or get a fine of 60 rand. Now, 60 rand for a black person those, those years was a lot of money. Many of them could not afford it, even if they had a good job. Now, also on this booklet will stipulate, will stand, the movements of a black person in his country of birth. It will tell them at which places they could be, which places they could not be, what time in a place, what time they would be out of these places also. In all CBD areas, all black people had to be off the streets also by 8 o'clock the evening. If they contravene these laws, they will go to jail also for six months without a trial or get a fine. Now we can hear the black people were restricted in the country of birth. They were restricted very much. Now the prisons throughout this country was filled up with the black people. Mother and fathers was in prison while the little black children was roaming the streets becoming orphans those years also. Because there was no one to take care of them at home. They became orphans. They were looking after themselves, child looking after child. They became orphans a lot of black children those years because of that law also. Now, Robert Zapuke told all the black people in 1960 that they must take this booklet, this pass law, and they must march to all the nearest police stations that they live at. And when they get to these police stations, they must burn out this booklet and hand themselves over to be arrested. Now, this must happen in 1960 on the 21st of March. Now, the 21st of March today, we celebrate it as a public holiday. It is called our Human Rights Day, where we commemorate those that have died in the struggle. Now, in 1960, 21st of March, all the black people in the early hours of the morning started to march. Now, this was a peaceful demonstration against the past law. But in a place called Sharpville, <coughs> sorry, in a place called Sharpville, just outside Johannesburg, the police, they panic. They opened up fire with live ammunition because they saw the thousands of people coming down upon the prison to hand themselves <laughs> over to Paris and to burn out this booklet. The police panicked. They opened up fire with live ammunition. They killed 69 people in Sharpwell alone. Women, children and men were shot in their backs while trying to run away from the bullets. Also in Cape Town, a place called Langa, where Philip Kosana was marching, 23 people were also gunned down. Now it was called the Sharpwell Langa Massacre. Now, the reason why Robert Zabuke asked the black people to hand themselves over to be arrested, because he wanted to confuse the system, because he knew the amount of black people outnumbered the amount of prisons there was in this country. So confuse the system, fill up all the prisons and see what's going to happen after mm -hmm. that. Because there will still be millions of black people outside waiting to be arrested. And you cannot arrest all the prisons because there are too much. So confuse the system, fill up the prisons, he said. And they did so. And the police answered with live bullets. Like I said, they killed 
69 in Shafal and they killed 23 in Ketan. It was called the Shafal Langa Massacre. Now because of that massacre, the whole world's attention was now on South Africa. Countries that you come from this bus and many other countries started to put sanctions upon South Africa, started to boycott South Africa's goods. South Africa was also expelled from all sports. Olympics, soccer, rugby, cricket, they were expelled altogether. South Africa became isolated throughout the world. Also, Robben Island was also opened as a political prison after that. The ANC and the PAC was also banned after that. Now, the PAC was not even one year old, only a few months in existence. And they could orchestrate such a big march against the government. They became a danger. Robert Zabuke became the number one enemy to the government. Not violently, but politically. He, he was dangerous. Now, thousands was arrested and thousands was injured. Robert Zabuke was also arrested. He was sentenced in a court of law to three years imprisonment in Pretoria Central. Now, just before his three years was about to be finished, the government had a meeting in Parliament. And they came up with a law that was named after Robert Booker, just to govern one man, Robert Booker. And that law was named after him, but it was called the Zabuke Clause. And this clause stipulated that as soon as Robert Booker comes out of prison, a free man, that they can rearrest him, put him back in prison for indefinite without a trial. Mm. Now the Minister of Justice, he said also in Parliament, that they must sentence Robert Booker until the other side of eternity. This man should not be set free at all. Now, when he came out of prison a free man in 1963, thinking that he was going to be set free, his supporters was also waiting for him outside the prison. The police was also waiting for him. Then the police put him in a helicopter. They flew this man straight to Robert Island by helicopter. That prison there, like I said, was prepared only for him. When he was brought here to the island in 1963, that prison there, that house, became his living coffin. This whole fence of area here became his whole world. He couldn't go beyond this fence of area. <laughs> while being kept on this island as a prisoner. Now, from 1963 until 1967, for the first four years, his sentence was, his punishment was actually, that this man, for the first four years, must be kept in solitary confinement for four years. Not allowed to talk to anyone for the first four years inside that building over there, that prison. Now, imagine, under such conditions, now they gave him books to read, they also gave him and a radio to listen to but he was not allowed to talk to anyone for the first four years. What's going to happen to any human being under such conditions? He became senile. All his vocal cords were damaged. Now also, when he came to the island as a prisoner, it was said he was already suffering from lung cancer. Now he was a chain smoker all these years. Now when he came to the island as a prisoner, this warden's here gave him also the most expensive tobacco to smoke. Cancer was spreading up rapidly throughout his body. Now, he became weaker by the days. After 1967, when he became ill, it was said that his family could come and visit him. His wife, her name is Veronica, she's 87 today, she's still alive. He had three sons, one son died, his daughter today is still alive. Now, for the whole six years that he was kept on this island, his family could only visit him for two weeks out of the whole six years. Now, there was a lady in Parliament by the name of Helen Sussman, powerful Jewish lady. She was the only female in Parliament those years. Out of 200 men, the only female. And she came to Robben Island through the United Nations and to the Red Cross Association. To come, see the to come see the condition of all the prisoners on the island. When she came here, she saw Robert Booker, and he told her, Yalan, I cannot make a sentence anymore. For that, and for a professor in linguistics, he couldn't put a sentence together anymore. Yeah, the only way that he could communicate with the other prisoners was when he stand by the gate over there, and he will see them walk past, and they will see him, and he will greet the angel like this, and the PNC like this, and then he will pick up sand from the ground, let the sand filter through his fingers, and that was a sign unto all of them that they are the sons and the soil of Africa. They must keep up the struggle. So he encouraged them to go forth for the struggle. Now, now the wardens at the prison, at the maximum security prison, when they are counting all the prisoners, when they come back from their hard labor, they will count all the prisoners every day. Then they will count, for example, 900 plus one. Then the prisoners will always ask, who is that plus one prisoner? And that plus one person was Robert Zapuka. Then they will see and the loneliest man stand by the gate and they will know it is Robert Zabuke. He is the plus one prisoner. Now in 1969, when he became very ill, it was thought that this man was going to die on the island. They took him off the island by boat. They didn't want this man to die here because if he should die here, he'll die and a martyr's death. They took him off the island by boat. When they came in Harbour in Cape Town, thinking that he was going to be set free, the police was again waiting for him there also. They implemented a new law called house arrest upon him. He was taken all the way from Cape Town to Kimberley. In Kimberley, he was kept under strict conditions again. He died there in 1978 at the early age of 54. It's only then 
that this man's body was set free when it was laid to rest at the place of birth called Grafrenet. Now in Grafrenet there's a museum about him, also in Kimlin there's a museum about him. There's also a book you can purchase at our courier shops called How Can a Man Die Better? Written by Benjamin Pilgrim. Any questions as far? Does he have any books? It's a book, eh? Yes. There's a book also called uh, The Land is Ours. Is there also? It's at the courier shop, yeah. Now, if you ask yourself the question, why did they bring this man here in the first place? This man did no crime, yet they brought him here. The only other logic why they brought him here was not for what he did, but for what he could do. That's right. That's why they brought him here. Thank you.